Today, I want to focus on answering several important questions that I've seen in many of your comments, which by the way, I do read, I read all of them, and my apologies if I cannot get back to everybody's uh, comments and questions, but please know that I read them and I greatly appreciate them, so please continue to make comments. If you have questions or challenges in guitar, please let me know in the comments and I would be happy to make future videos like this one or like other more detailed videos to help you progress faster and answer your questions. So let's start with the first question, which is from um, at Hargis P2. Uh, asks, what about strings? Basically, what kind of strings do I like and how long do they last? So let's answer this backwards. So first of all, as far as how long the strings last, I think that really depends on how much you play and how long you've had the strings on the guitar. Now, I play professionally. This is what I do for a living. I also teach. Uh, mostly I teach professionally, but I play roughly two, sometimes up to maximum three hours a day. Before I had kids, <laughs> it was three to four hours a day. And when that was the case, I was changing my bass strings probably every two to four weeks, and my treble strings every one to two months. Now that I play almost half as much, about two, two to three hours, I change my bass strings about once every three to five weeks, and my treble strings about once every two to three months. It really depends. If you're playing just 30 minutes a day, you could probably get away with changing your basses every couple months, and your treble strings every like three or four months. At the end of the day, what you wanna look for on the guitar is first of all any kind of damage to the string. So if the treble strings are nicked, if you just run your fingers across the strings and you feel any kind of burrs, then that string's about to pop. You need to change that one immediately. And if you just take a look at your bass strings, you can see if any of the metal is unraveling, if there's any breaks in the strings, change those right away. The other sign is the tone or the, the, the tuning as well. If the strings start to sound dull, then the strings are done, then they need to be changed. And also, if they start coming out of tune in one practice session over and over again, then that means they're overstretched and need to be changed. So there are three main factors to keep in mind, but at the end of the day, it really depends on how long you play. Now, as far as the strings that I like and I recommend, I use these Daddario strings. Now, I don't have the other pack, but I use two, I buy my strings in, in, in split sets. So I buy a set of bass strings and then sort of an accompanying set of treble strings. I will have links to those in the description below. I'm not suggesting that these are the best strings in the world. They're the best strings for me, in my opinion, for my guitars. Uh, you know, different strings could be better for your guitars. But the reason I love these is uh, because these bass strings, this is, these are the Dynacore bass strings, uh, normal tension. They're, they have just enough growl, uh, the growl that I like, just enough brightness, but they're still, they're still warm enough for me. So they kind of have just the right tone uh, that I like. And they, all the strings I found typically last the same amount of time. Now the, the treble strings that I use, it's the same brand, they look, the package looks the same, but the trebles that I use have a composite G. Uh, I don't know if you can see this in the camera. Maybe you can a little bit. So the G is a, is a kind of a brownish a tan color. It's a composite nylon with who knows what else, maybe carbon. What I like about it is that it makes the string a little bit thinner and it balances the sound across the treble strings. With regular nylon strings, I find that the G string is too tubby and it sounds kind of almost not, not dull, but just, I don't know, too warm and this composite string brightens it up. In any event, I'll have a link to those in the description below, and I think you'll love them. Try them out, let me know what you think. I'd love to hear about that. The next question is by Otukana WV2RT. Uh, she says, I'd love to know how to develop left-hand isometric strength for pieces like Via Lobos number one. Uh, when I get to the last B7, before the diminished sequence, my hand is falling apart. So I haven't played Via Lobos number one in a long time. This is for all of you who don't know this piece. This is a... Uh, it's a, a really great uh, arpeggio etude to check out. So if you haven't played it, definitely check it out. So I think what we really need to look at first are two main factors for the left hand. And the first one tends to be pressing too hard uh, on the strings, which by the way is common for most people, especially if you're, if you're a beginner to intermediate. One thing you can do is start with single fingers to make sure that your pressure is, op is at an optimal level. So you can take, for example, this is the sixth string, fifth fret, I'm just gonna touch the string with my first finger and then I'm gonna play with my thumb so that it's muted like this. I'm gonna keep playing it and I'm gonna start pressing little by little with that finger until I get it to buzz. It's gonna sound kind of nasty. I'm gonna keep pressing until that note is clean and no more. There. That's clean. That's as much as I wanna press. Now I wanna hold that and I wanna lift and then go back down so that I can memorize that optimal note optimal pressure and I'm going to do the same thing for all fingers now that's just for single single finger single strings you can do the same thing for chords so when you play a chord like E minor 
right? Where you get to a B7, a diminished chord, and anything like that. You know, B7, I remember the last uh, op, uh, variation for B7 in viola was one, but for example, if this is B7, that includes all four fingers. You can do the same thing with each finger. Optimal pressure, optimal pressure, optimal pressure. All right. And that's going to be a good starting point. So I would start there, right? For everybody who's having left hand issues and left hand fatigue, that's the first thing that I would do. The second thing that I would do is if you're not used to having long practice sessions, start with very short practice sessions and very short uh, phrases, very short chunks of material. So sometimes the hands fatigue just because we're not used to playing for such a long time. Honestly, I would recommend starting with 15 minutes in a practice session and then progressively increase your time, maybe five to 10 minutes per week or every two weeks and see how that goes and then adjust accordingly. But I would start 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then just, I don't know, maybe the first couple of lines, see how that goes. Then the next week add in a few extra measures and slowly you start to chain each section of your piece together as you get used to playing for longer practice sessions. But at the end of the day, the pressure, the left hand pressure is gonna be the main, main factor that makes your hand fatigue. Another thing to think about is uh, ask yourself if you're taking enough breaks. Breaks are crucial for injury prevention, but they're also extremely important for memory, for just consolidation of the new information. So breaks help us assimilate the information. It allows the brain to replay everything while we're taking a break, as long as we're not multitasking. So ask yourself if you're taking breaks. If not, maybe try to incorporate extra breaks into your playing. What I do is after roughly every one to two repetitions, I take my hands off the guitar completely and let them completely relax. Close my eyes, breathe for a couple seconds, and then do it again. After roughly every 15 to 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes, uh, I will get up. I set a, a timer for this, by the way. I will get up, stretch, go get a glass of water, and take frequent breaks. I'm taking breaks all the time. And uh, I think that's keeping me healthy and sane because <laughs> I can't sit for such a long time. So please consider that. That could be another thing that could be causing the hand fatigue. Question three is from Magdalena Asuravsky. I think I'm pronouncing that right. She says, I have a question about the interleaf practice. When you call a task A, B, C, are you referring to something small? For example, three different phrases you aren't getting right in a single piece or to another type of task in your practice routine. So she gives an example. So that A, B, C might be warm up A, the piece you're learning B and improvisation C. Thanks for this great video. That's an awesome question as well. So what I initially recommend all the time is that you always start with the small sections of music. So you mentioned ABC referring to something small. Absolutely. I would start with your challenges, right? So if you are working on a piece of music, first identify your challenge spots, what, what I like to call the errors or challenge spots, and then work on interleaving those. So select a few, it could be two, three, four, five, however many uh, works for you. And then do a couple of sets, maybe two or three sets of those so that you're interleaving those. As that gets better, then you can start to work on larger passages for different reasons. So maybe all of your mechanical challenges are solved at your goal tempo, but now you're working on expressive variation and you want to work on that phrase by phrase. Then you can work on phrase one. It could be like eight measures. Phrase two is another eight measures. It doesn't have to be eight measures, but you know what I mean. You can split those up and interleave them. Uh, but that's you want to start small and then work up to larger sections. Now, what I would not do is interleave the warm up, the the piece, and then the improvisation. I would start every practice session with the warm up. So the warm up is first all the time uh, for me. I recommend that. Of course, everybody's different, but that's what I highly, highly recommend. I do 10 minutes of warm up. It's almost always the same for me, no matter what I do next. So sometimes I have my warm up and then technique, and then maybe I have warm up. And my, another practice session would be warm up and then repertoire. Sometimes I have just a limited time in one day and only have one session, which is rare, but I might do warm up and then technique and repertoire. And then the next day, if it's just an hour, I might do warm up, repertoire and technique. So I'm switching the order a little bit. So that's how you can apply interleaving. Again, start small and then you can do uh, do bigger, bigger chunks. Okay. The next question is from Chuck Rose. Chuck R. Rose. Uh, he says, seems like if one, seems like if one makes three uh, consecutive mistakes, it's probably a knowledge or a tempo problem. Uh, I, I definitely agree. Uh, could be one more thing too. Uh, need to go back and make sure you really know what you're practicing and or slow the process down considerably, right? Yes, absolutely, hands down. I think the biggest reason, the biggest two reasons for mistakes are tempo, so the speed is too fast, and uh, and tension. So those two things are typically, the, at least this is totally anecdotally. This is from my personal experience and then from what I've seen from my students and, and other, other musicians as well. So I know sometimes we don't feel like we have a lot of tension. If you're not sure, what I would recommend is 
practice in front of a mirror so you can see it. Sometimes your shoulder ends up in your ear, not you, but you know, I don't know you, Chuck, but for me, that's what happens. That's my biggest problem for, for tension. I have to watch myself. I open up a blank Zoom screen, and so I see myself on my computer, and I'll watch to see if I have any tension. So uh, that's one thing that you can do. Make sure to minimize that and just scan your body randomly for tension. And then, of course, uh, what you mentioned, the other thing is knowledge, of course. I think we can think of knowledge in music maybe more as memorization. So if you don't have something memorized and really internalized, that can create a lot of gaps. So I would absolutely recommend slowing down. But I don't think that's the only strategy that we can use. I like to slow down. Usually, I, but let me back up for a second. Usually, I like to approach the correction of a challenge at, at whatever tempo I'm at in that given moment. So I'll try the challenge at, let's say, I don't know, let's say it's 100 beats per minute. I make a mistake. I'll try it again at 100 beats per minute, and then I'll slow down if I make a mistake again. I don't do that exclusively. Sometimes if I feel like a passage is persistently difficult, then the next time I approach it, I try it at 100, make a mistake, then I'll slow down considerably and try to work out that correction at a very slow tempo and then work on building that speed back up. Okay, I hope that helps. The next question is from Priscilla Boatman. <laughs> uh, uh, Priscilla Boatman says, why do you wear the sleeve? So the sleeve, here's the sleeve, this thing, this thing. What I used to use was an old sock and I would just cut the toe off and then put it on my arm. So let me do that real quick. So these are great. And there are two main reasons why I use the sleeve. So let me show you. So reason number one is, uh, you, can, you can see this in the camera still. Reason number one is one is because I play a lot and I play five, six, five, usually six days a week. And uh, if I didn't have the sleeve and I move my arm around, I would end up with the equivalent of rug burn on my forearm, which is quite painful. And I've had that happen before. So this helps eliminate that. The other thing that is the sleeve is helpful for is just being able to slide smoothly on the side of the guitar. So especially if you're going to change your tone, let's say I'm playing uh, something here. It's hard to see this, but here this is like a round sound make that bright right I can slide very smoothly on the side of the guitar without getting stuck and without needing to lift my arm and replant it again so the sleeve is super super useful I highly recommend it um, it's usually pretty hot where I live um, so I don't that's why you may see me in a lot of videos with short sleeve shirts and the sleeve now I don't think you need to get the sleeve that I use but if you want to do that I do have a link to that in the description below otherwise grab an old sock cut the toe off and you're good to go uh, I just ran out of socks, so I decided to buy uh, these sleeves, and they're great. I think they come in like a pack of five, and it's like eight bucks, so it's super cheap. So check that out. That'll be in the description below. The next question is from at McShreddy. At McShreddy, that is an, that is an awesome name. Um, at McShreddy says, love this. Would be awesome if you could illustrate what the 70 to 85% success rate means exactly on a few examples. Suppose, for instance, I'm working on increasing my tempo on a simple chromatics exercise like the spider. Is the idea that I should select the beat per minute or tempo where I make about one mistake for every four cycles through the exercise. So yes, I think in part, that's one way you can go about it. However, I would start with a smaller challenge. I would try to, if you're working on the spider chromatic exercise or whatever exercise you happen to be working on, try to identify the first mistake that you make and make that your initial challenge uh, spot. And then if you make another mistake, you can make that your, your second challenge spot. And then you want to work on correcting each each error so that you end up around 70 to 85 percent again initially this is always just an initial uh, suggestion as they get better you want to get closer and closer to to 100 percent and then as you get better at solving those then you can make your entire uh, phrase bigger and i, I mentioned that with uh, another question that somebody asked but initially that's the way that we do it now you are in luck because I've read everybody's comments on my videos, especially on the one you're referring to on uh, how many repetitions to do. And I did make a video that you can check out where I demonstrate exactly how all of these strategies work and that is up on the screen right now. All right, thank you so much everybody. See you next time, bye-bye.